Shalom. Welcome to Kabbalah 101. I am David Fairman. I'm the first elder of the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship. I have been doing this for almost four years now. I have been teaching Kabbalah for about a year and a half at this point. I'm going to start by offering a prayer. Elohim Shaddai, thank you that you're able to come here before thee today to learn more of thee and thy ways, to fellowship one with another as saints, and to share in thy spirit of wisdom and knowledge as we learn about Mormon Kabbalah. Please bless us today as teachers and as students that we will speak one to another spirit to spirit and hear all of the things that you once said, whether they are vocalized or not, that we will feel your will and know your ways. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. So might it be, amen. So welcome to Kabbalah 101. So we start with the scripture, O ye that are pure in heart, lift up your heads and receive the pleasing word of God and feast upon his love, for ye may, if your minds are firm forever. And that is from the Book of Mormon, Jacob 2.50 in the RAV and 3.2 in the OPV. What we're going to go over today is Mormon Kabbalah and the spirit of Ubuntu. When we say Mormon Kabbalah, what we're really trying to say is the Book of Mormon plus Kabbalah. In traditional Kabbalah, really in, in all Kabbalah, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, are the key scriptures. Everything else is a commentary. If you're a Christian Kabbalist, then the Gospels are a commentary on the Torah. Uh, to a Jewish Kabbalist, all the rest of the Old Testament is a commentary on the Torah. And to we as Latter-day Saints and Mormons, the Book of Mormon is a commentary on Kabbalah. Um, there is a mystical tradition that uses the Zohar, and we do touch on that from time to time. But really the key commentary for Mormon Kabbalists is going to be the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Book of Mormon. Now, within the Church of Jesus Christ or Christian Fellowship, uh, we do also have the Book of Enoch, the Law of the Lord, from James Strang, translating the Brass Plates, the Book of Remembrance, and really, because we are a non-denominational movement, any scripture that you feel moves you to, to learn more about God and helps you in that connection can be used as a point, as a point of Mormon Kabbalah. But generally speaking, if we're going to talk about Mormon Kabbalah, we're talking about the Bible and the Book of Mormon and possibly a version of the Doctrine and Covenants. We're also going to go over Kabbalah as a concept. What is Kabbalah? What does it mean? How long has it been around? Why are we studying Kabbalah? What does Kabbalah have to do with Mormonism? And we're also going to talk about Ubuntu. Ubuntu is an African word, basically means oneness, unity. And that's really what the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship is about, is unity. How do we unify as saints, not just within each individual denomination, but how do we as saints unify in our various denominations? How do we become one movement and not just a group of different churches all claiming to be the one true church? So what is, what is, what is Mormon? It talks about Mormon Kabbalah here. Now, as I said, it's the Book of Mormon plus Kabbalah. So the Latter-day Saint movement has over 100 different denominations. About 70 or more identify as Mormons. Now, the largest group of these has recently decided that they're not going to be Mormons anymore, and that's fine. There are members that agree with that and members that don't, and we'll see what, what happens over time. But Joseph Smith was a Mormon. As long as Joseph Smith was a Mormon, then in my mind, Anyone that is siding with Joseph Smith shouldn't be too ashamed to be called a Mormon. And plus, Latter-day Saint Kabbalah is really just too bulky. It, it, it's a better way to say it. It's more accurate, but it's just too long of a title. So Mormon Kabbalah, tying it back to the Book of Mormon and the Waters of Mormon, uh, where Alma was baptizing people, that really has more of a, of a unifying concept for us as saints, because this is the New Covenant. Uh, to the Jews, the Torah was, was the covenant, the law. And to Christians, the gospel is the new covenant. Well, to us as Latter-day Saints, the Book of Mormon is the renewed covenant. So we have all three of these covenants placed upon us. Now, Kabbalah is from a, 
Well, there's a couple ways of looking at this. According to Google Dictionary, it means tradition or to receive or accept. But if you talk to a Kabbalist, Kabbalah isn't tied to any specific Hebrew word. In Judaism, there's two parts of the Torah. There's the written Torah and there's the oral Torah. Now, to most Jews, because they're rabbinical, the Babylonian Talmud would be part of that oral Torah, or it would be considered the oral Torah. Um, other variations of Jews may have other versions of the, of the oral Torah or leave it out altogether. But I want to express to you why the oral Torah is so important. So when you're reading these stories in the book of Genesis, for example, the way that if a Jew that uses the Talmud and uses the oral Torah would describe it, they would say that there are these traditions that are tied to these. When Moses sat down to write this out and write out the law, Genesis, you know, getting everybody up, up, to, up to speed was just one book. There was a lot more information, and the idea was that when a parent reads the Torah to their child and reads a specific tale, they're going to embellish it, and they're going to keep that tradition and move it forward. They're going to share the extra part of the story that didn't fit, and that's why it's the oral Torah. Now, originally, keep in mind, all of the Torah was oral. Moses didn't actually sit there and write this all out. He may have written down portions of it, but the Torah that we have today is a written down version of the oral Torah. But they divided in Judaism between these two branches. But what is, what's your tradition? The Book of Mormon talks about this idea that traditions of men are bad. So why do we care about these traditions? Well, keep in mind that as Latter-day Saints, we have our own traditions, right? April 6th is when, when the, the Church of Christ was originally founded by Joseph Smith. And most Latter-day Saint movements have some sort of traditional gathering either on or around April 6th. That is a tradition. That is our Kabbalah. Uh, we have the tradition of the Book of Mormon, these stories that go around. For example, uh, Mohonrai Moriankamer, the idea that someone, a, a child was blessed and given that name by Joseph Smith and that that's the brother of Jared. That's not written in the Book of Mormon. That's part of our oral tradition. That's part of our Kabbalah. And, and every branch of the Latter-day Saint movement has their, their version of the Talmud, if you will, these extra scriptures that, that are given by the Lord to these people. Because the other part of Kabbalah is to receive or to accept. And, and this is us accepting these things that the Lord has given us. The 14th article of faith this will be the 13th for the Latter -day, Utah Latter-day Saint tradition, says, We believe in being honest, true, chaste, temperate, benevolent, virtuous, and upright, in doing good to all men. Indeed, we may say we follow the admonition of Paul. We believe all things. We hope all things. We have endured many things and hope to be able to endure all things. Everything virtuous, lovely, praiseworthy, good report. We seek after these things. That is Kabbalah. That is the spirit of Kabbalah to believe all things. Now, that doesn't mean that we literally believe everything, but it means that we look for the truth. We look for the good in all these things. We receive what God gives us. We accept the things that the Lord has provided to us. That is Kabbalah. So we have the Book of Mormon for Mormon, and we have the other revelations, our traditions, and all the things that we receive and have accepted as Kabbalah. Now, there are some key differences between traditional Kabbalah, Christian Kabbalah, Islamic Kabbalah, and all these other branches of Kabbalah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of them. So what, what are these differences with Mormon Kabbalah? Well, there's a lot of things we can go over, but we're not going to go all over all of them today. The key things that we need to know about are, number one, unlike traditional Kabbalah, which is waiting for the Messiah to come, we believe that Jesus Christ is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is the, our emissary to Elohim, and he is the example of the living word, the Torah. So to us as Christians, and, and this, is a, this is a difference that we share with Christian Kabbalah, we, we have the, the Torah, and then we have the Gospels, and the Gospels are the Torah lived. The Gospels are the example of what it looks like if someone were to walk the Torah every day, and that's Jesus Christ. Key difference number two is rather than focusing on the Zohar and these other writings, which, which we will dive into and we will look at at some point, uh, and you will notice that there are writings from them on the website, 
our focus is on the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, the Brass Plates, which for us currently is the Book of the Law of the Lord, and, and other works to understand the Torah. Now, that doesn't mean we won't use the Zohar. It just means that we have additional things besides just these Jewish texts to focus on. And the third key difference ties back to the first, and that is that focus on personal growth in Christ's grace. A key point to Kabbalah for all Kabbalah, Kabbalistic styles is to se separate us from ego, to create godly altruism within us, to enable our true nature, who we were in the pre-existence. Now, how that happens, how that how we grow in grace, that's something that we can discuss. But the fact that we're growing in Christ's grace is a key difference between us and Jewish Kabbalah. And there are some Christian Kabbalists who don't believe there's a need to grow in Christ's grace. That once we're saved, we're just always saved. And so we just have the grace. And that is true. We do just have the grace. But because we have the grace, as Jacob says in the Book of Mormon, we're moved to do God's works. And that's Jacob 3, 8 in the RAV, 4, 7 in the OPV. So what is the key that binds Kabbalah? What is it that ties every Kabbalist together? A Jewish rabbi was one an, once asked to go over Kabbalah by, while standing on one leg. And everything he knew about Kabbalah while standing on one leg. And he said, love God, love your neighbor. What did Christ teach was the top two commandments, the most important two commandments that all the law and the prophet rest on. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. These are the keys that bind Mormonism or the Latter-day Saint movement and Kabbalah. They're the things that bind Christianity, Christian Kabbalah, to the Latter-day Saint movement and Jewish Kabbalah or traditional Kabbalah. This is really everything that we go through, everything that we learn, whether it's getting into giving someone a blessing to heal them, connecting to God on a higher, deeper level, and getting to know God and more personally, all of this, it all ties to loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. And Jesus, this is Jesus talking, it says, Behold, it is written also that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But behold, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise upon the evil and on the good. Therefore, those things which were of old time, which were under the law, are in me fulfilled. Old things are done away, and all things have become new. Therefore, I would that ye should be perfect, even as I or your Father in heaven, who is in heaven, is perfect. Now, this is not exactly the same as it's written in chapter 5 of Matthew in the New Testament. And I'm not going to go over all the differences here because that's not what's important. What's important is we're given this commandment. And so many people I hear focus on this idea to be perfect. Be perfect even as, as the Father is perfect. Or here as it says, be perfect as Christ, as Jesus Christ and the Father is perfect. What is perfection? What does that mean? Does that mean that we have to fulfill the letter of every law? In, in Jesus' time, you had these Pharisees and Sadducees who pile laws on top of the laws. It's like, listen, if you're obeying these laws, then you know you're good. You know you're obeying the, the Torah because you're just going that extra mile. But in doing that, they weren't obeying the spirit of the law, to love God and to love your neighbor. So if you want to know how to be perfect, it's right here. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them who despitefully use and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. Do these things, and you'll be perfect, even as Christ and the Father are perfect. What did Christ say on the cross? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Someone asked me recently a question. It's a very popular question. Why does God let bad things happen to good people? And my response is always, why does he let good things happen to bad people? It's because he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. So we, therefore, as Mormon Kabbalists, are to love everyone just as God loves everyone. We're to give everyone the opportunity that God gives everyone. Jesus will judge. We will love. 
Christ in the spirit of Ubuntu. That was the third part we're going to talk about. What is Ubuntu? Ubuntu means humanity towards others. It is a belief in a universal bond of sharing that connects all of us. And it means basically, I am because we are. So let's go over those. Humanity towards others. How do we show humanity towards other people? By loving them, by treating them like humans. It's so easy to push them to the wayside and pretend like they don't exist, pretend like they're a lesser, or pretend like they're a greater. This person is above me. I shouldn't speak to them. I shouldn't help them. I shouldn't do anything with them. That will disrespect them somehow. This person is beneath me. It will disrespect me somehow. No, that's ego talking. Altruism loves all. We're all humans. God sees us all as equal. Grace is the great equalizer. Christ is the great equalizer. So therefore, because we're all humans, there is a universal bond of sharing that connects all of us. It's easy to see. Even though we all live in our own bubbles with our headphones on, you know, walking around the supermarket, the mall, or wherever we are, ignoring everyone, we're all still there serving each other. The people in the stores are there. What do they do? They help you find whatever you're trying to buy. They sell to you. Those people that are buying, where do they get the money? They went out and, and did some other type of labor. There's this idea that we're all divided, but we're only divided by these invisible fences. The reality is that we're still tied together by this universal bond that connects all of us. We still cannot exist without coexisting. And once we identify this, we start drawing these lines and realize that we are one. And the goal is now that we know that we're one to become one in Christ. And we do this by realizing the third point of Ubuntu. I am because we are. Everything I am, yes, I have my free agency. Yes, I make my own decisions. But my decisions are based on what? The teachers that taught me, the parents that raised me, the books that I read, the things that I do to help other people. It's that universal bond. We are who we are, not merely because of our genes or because of the abstract concepts that we decide to believe in in a vacuum. Nothing we do is in a vacuum. Everything is based on our perception of the world. And through the Mormon Kabbalah, our perception changes and we see the world as God sees it, which is to say that it is good. And by seeing that it is good, we're able to love all, show humanity towards others, live in that universal bond that connects us, and become our true selves. John 17, 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I will give them that they may be one, even as we are one. What does that mean to you? But I want you to think about it. I'd like for you to write it down because this time next year, your perception of what this scripture means might be very different than what it is right now because it should be. Our perception should change as we grow in grace until we receive the full, fullness from the Father as joint heirs with Christ. There are seven principles to Mormon Kabbalah, and we have to understand these because they kind of pile up one on another. Without having one, the whole thing really falls apart. It all starts with God is real. Why is that important? Well, why are you going to study anything about God if you don't believe in God? That doesn't make any sense. We first have to recognize that there is a God. And we also have to recognize that everyone that knows God is real is going to understand God in a different way. And that's okay too. God meets us where we are. And so therefore we must meet others where they are too. So now we know God's real. Well, what's next? We have to understand that God is good. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Of course God's good. Actually, there's a lot of people out there who believe God is evil. Well, how are we going to move forward if we don't understand the goodness of God? Once we recognize that God is the opposite of us, all bestowing, all giving, and loving his fallen creation, we recognize that we are fallen beings. We aren't worthy, but we want to be. And that is the third principle of Mormon Kabbalah. We are created to be saved. 
We weren't sent here to fail. If you look at, in the New Testament, John 3.16, that is one of the most famous scriptures probably in Christendom. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God is good. At number 17, the one right after it, maybe, if not equally important, a little more. Because it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him might be saved. We were created to be saved. So this whole idea of, oh, coming to Christ, you're going to hell. Oh, you know, follow me, you're going to go to hell. That is not a principle of Mormon Kabbalah. In Mormon Kabbalah, we were created from the very beginning for salvation. Now we've been created to be saved. How are we saved? That's principle four. We have the freedom to choose. We have to make the decision that we want to be saved. God doesn't make us good. The devil doesn't make us evil. We have access to both good and evil and must choose between them for ourselves. We're tempted by ego to take for ourselves. But true joy comes when we give ourselves for others. We've chosen God now. We've made this choice. The next step is going to be to love and serve God, right? That's logical. If I've chosen God, I'm not saying, oh yeah, I choose God. I'm going to go over here and do this now. No, you've chosen God, so now you're going to serve God. How do we serve God? By loving our neighbors. Loving our neighbors is key to all of this, because if we are, are the creation of God, then so are our neighbors. And if we're here to till the soil, as Genesis says, then that means that we're here to help with the creation. And how do we help with the creation? How do we till the soil? We show our love for God by our love for our neighbors. As King Benjamin famously said in his address to his people, when you're in the service of others, you are only in the service of your God. Really, loving God and loving your neighbors are so close, it's, it's hard to say that one isn't the other. Jesus said that loving God is the first great commandment and loving your neighbor is the second. Well, I believe that's because it's easy to fall in the trap of ego if you do the second one first. But if you love God, then you do the second, loving your neighbors with, with Christ-like altruism. And that leads to the seventh principle of Mormon Kabbalah. Change perception, change reality. That's what all of this is about. Reality is defined by how we see the world. And after we've taken these other steps, we begin to walk the path of Teshuva. The way we see the world changes. When we see through human eyes, we see weakness and sin. But once we're born again, our perception changes and we see God's creation as he sees it. It is good. Now we live these seven principles. And as we grow in grace, our eyes will be open and we'll see the miracle of God in our lives.